Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Matt Nash. For those of you who might know me, I am the uh, Managing Director for Social Innovation and Social Entrepreneurship at the Duke Innovation and Entrepreneurship Initiative. Raise your hands if you're familiar with Duke i &E, so I can just see how many. Fantastic. There are some of you who are, but many of you aren't. For those of you who don't know us, we are the university-wide initiative that's really charged with advancing innovation and entrepreneurship across Duke, social, commercial, arts, really helping with you know, programming, curriculum, research, faculty support. We are actually created by the Board of Trustees. We are part of the Provost's Office, and we're on the path to hopefully becoming an institute by uh, next spring or, or next fall. Uh, and really, we're here to support the entire university. And, and in, in my role in the social innovation and entrepreneurship uh, portfolio, you know, we really aspire to continue to make Duke a global leader in promoting the innovative pursuit of, of uh, challenges, of, of, of innovation, innovative solutions, sorry, to um, social problems. And we're really interested in innovation and sustainability. Uh, we've had such a great tradition of this at Duke, whether it's from the classes of Tony Brown, whether it's the wonderful work of CASE, the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship, where I was executive director before coming to i &E, and so many other faculty uh, and, and parts of Duke Engage and the Global Health Institute. So it's a really rich tradition at Duke. And many of you may or may not know that this is actually Global Entrepreneurship Week. So on campuses all around the world, um, there are various speakers, events, you know, workshops and stuff going on to really promote entrepreneurship. And I, I can't think of a better way to celebrate Global Entrepreneurship Week than here at Duke than really saluting, celebrating one of the world's leading social entrepreneurs. Now, many of you may know the, the chairman of Duke's Board of Trustees, David Rubenstein, and he was speaking at an event a few years ago, and, and someone asked him, I can't remember if it was a student or who, who his heroes are in the world of entrepreneurship. And he mentioned Bill Gates, he mentioned um, Steve Jobs, and he mentioned Wendy Kopp. I can't think of a better example of a social entrepreneur who's really taking on such a critical issue of education in our world and really bringing with it all the drive, the innovation, the grit that's needed to address this issue. So we're thrilled to, to welcome uh, Wendy here tonight. You'll have a chance to hear a little bit more about her in a moment when she's more properly introduced. But I just want to extend a brief welcome on behalf of Duke I. So to jump into our event tonight, what we thought it would be nice to do is actually have a, a proper introduction. And I'm pleased to introduce the person who will introduce Wendy. Uh, and to introduce tonight, we have someone who's uh, both a student here and who's actually participated in Teach for America. So uh, Martine Aurelian is a first year student in the Masters of Public Policy student at the Sanford School. Uh, she's a graduate of Cornell University where she was a human uh, development studies major and she joined TFA in 2013 and was a core member in Eastern North Carolina actually in Weldon City Schools, where she taught high school social studies. So um, please join me in welcoming Martine to introduce Wendy. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> It's honestly truly an honor to stand before you tonight. Um, I'm incredibly humbled by the opportunity to be a part of this event and share this space with you and just a little bit of my narrative. Um, so as Matt was so kind to introduce, uh, my name is Martine, formerly known as Miss A, uh, depending on who asks, Miss A don't play. Um, <laughs> seriously, despite the 410 telling you. Um, so I did the core in Eastern North Carolina um, where I was a core member for three years. Um, and I'd honestly be remiss if I didn't shout out some of my Eastern North Carolina core member people who are in the front row came to support me today. So if you guys can just stand up real quick. These are people, stand up. <laughs> um, so not only are they core members, but they're also people here like dedicated to uh, this work and this state. Um, uh, both are lead, um, we have a principal and two principals in the making, so I'll stop embarrassing them. Um, but yes, so I'm a current graduate student at the Sanford School of Pu Public Policy, and as I mentioned earlier, I just want to share a little bit of my narrative with you and just hope that you are able to gain something from it. So when I think of my narrative and I think of my story, I think of three big things or three themes, if you will. Um, so I'm not going to bury the lead here, I'm just going to give it to you. I know it's been a long day, it's Tuesday, I had an econ midterm exam today. Um, so three things, so three objectives, here's my teacher. Um, so the first thing I think of is um, Kiswahili word for Ubuntu, 
which translates to I am who I am because you are. Secondly, I think of uh, the French verb to be, which translates to raison d'être, so one's reason of being. And then third, I think of servant leadership, innovation, if you will. So Ubuntu, I am who I am because you are. I grew up in the urban community of Hartford, Connecticut, where the majority of youth there are at war with cyclical poverty, poor education system that's really left them at high risks of early pregnancy, truancy, prison. This is a story a lot of my um, peers um, experience and are still living in. This is a story I was fortunate enough to escape um, because of the juxtaposition of my cultural upbringing, which I mean my relentless Haitian parents, um, and the instilled value and love that I have in education. My underserved community raised and it molded me and really taught me that roses could bud from concrete. My community molded me. It shaped the value and hope that I seek to instill in others. I am who I am because of who those people are, Ubuntu. Raison d'être, one's reason of being. So for the past three years, I had the pleasure of working in Weldon, North Carolina, uh, where I was a high school social studies teacher. So my role as a teacher through partnership with TFA was really the vessel by which I was able to work very deeply and embrace and become a transplant in that community. Uh, although definitely disadvantaged in a myriad of race, including cyclical poverty and socio-cultural socio underpinnings, Weldon and the greater Halifax community was also very rich in love and hospitality and an unparalleled strength. So, you know, my primary purpose there in Weldon was to teach and to serve, but little did I know how much it would actually serve to teach me. So one of the things that it taught me was this thing about power. Um, so typically on any given day, my identity um, as a black woman is, doesn't really do much for me, to be honest. But in that space, in that classroom, that identity that oftentimes is powerless became exponentially powerful. So from the things that I would say, from, how, from the things I would wear, the way those students looked at me because of those two things. But the moment I stepped out of that, it was very different. So it had a very strong impact on me. Additionally, um, it taught me an unparalleled love for 90 strangers uh, every single day who I keep in touch with. Um, on any given day. It taught me a, a maternal love, I don't have kids, but just something that you just really never experience from how they say your name to the questions that they ask to the things they think you really know and you gotta give an answer because you know they really think you know everything, it's great. Um, but you know, my work in the classroom has honestly been incredibly meaningful and impactful and thus far, uh, the most profound work that I've had the pleasure to engage in. Uh, the people and the children and the community have honestly captured my heart, my soul, and my mind. They've really helped me reveal my reason of being, ma raison d'être. And then my last thing, um, as I mentioned, when I think of my narrative, I think of servant leadership, innovation. So my work as an educator honestly has imbued a lifetime devotion to servant leadership. It's created change and solving some of the world's toughest problems in the most innovative ways. My time as an educator instilled a really new and renewed sense of self manifested through purpose. So I really invite you guys to join me in the sentiment, no matter what your life's work is, right? And please be reminded by the fact that every single day that you wake up, you make a difference. So it's incredibly imperative that you keep waking up, no matter, it is, no matter what it is that you do. Continue in the work that you're called to do. So please think about your Ubuntu. What is your reason of being? Who has helped you to become who you are? So whether you're here at Duke, whether you're a member or former member of TFA, um, we're all here in America in this innovative place and have the power to impact some incredible change. Um, and I'm a firm believer to whom much is given, much is required. So um, I just hope that you just remember that. Um, and we have an amazing woman here who really imbues that. So this truly brings me to introduce um, Wendy Kopp. I'm gonna read her bio and let her take the stage. Wendy Kopp is CEO and co-founder of Teach for All. 
a global network of independent organizations that are cultivating their nation's promising future leaders to ensure their most marginalized children have the chance to fulfill their potential. Wendy founded Teach for America in 1989 to marshal the energy of her generation against educational inequity in the United States. Today, more than 8,000 Teach for America Corps members, outstanding recent college graduates and professionals of all academic disciplines are in the midst of two-year teaching commitments in 52 urban and rural regions. And Teach for America has proven to be unparalleled source of long-term leadership for expanding opportunity for children. After leading Teach for America's growth and development for 24 years in 2013, Wendy transitioned out of the role of CEO Today, she remains an active member of Teach for America's board. Wendy led the development of Teach for All to be responsive to the initiative of inspiring social entrepreneurs around the world who are determined to adapt this approach in their countries. Now in its eighth year, the Teach for All network is comprised of partner organizations in 40 countries on six continents, including its founding partners, Teach for America and the UK's Teach First. Wendy is the author, author of A Chance to Make History, What Works and What Doesn't in Providing an Excellent Education for All and One Day All Children, The Unlikely Triumph of Teach for America and What I Learned Along the Way. She holds honorary doctorate degrees from University of Oklahoma, Boston University, Dartmouth College, Harvard University, Marquette University, Washington University in St. Louis, Georgetown, Mount Holyoke College, Rhodes College, Pace University, Mercy College, Smith College, Princeton University, Connecticut College, and Drew University. She is the youngest person and the first woman to receive Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson Award, the highest honor the school confers on its undergraduate alumni. In 1994, Time Magazine recognized her as one of the 40 most promising leaders under 40. In 2006, U.S. News and World Report named her as one of America's best leaders. And in 2008, Time Magazine recognized her as one of the world's, world's 100 most influential people. Wendy was the recipient of the Forbes 400 Lifetime Achievement Award, Most Influential People. Wendy has a... Uh, yes. She has also been recognized with the President's Citizens Medal, the Spelman College National Community Award, the Skoll Award for Social Entrepreneurship, the Harold W. McGraw J. Prize in Education Award, and the John F. Kennedy New Frontier Award, the Clinton Center Award for Leadership and National Service, the Schwab Foundation's Outstanding so Social Entrepreneur Award, Aetna's Voice of Conscious Award, the Citizen Activist Award from the Gleitzman Foundation, and the Jefferson Award for Public Service. Wendy serves on the board of New Profit and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Wendy holds a bachelor's degree from Princeton University, where she participated in undergraduate program of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. She resides in New York City with her husband, Richard Barth, and their four children. Please join me in welcoming Wendy Kopp to the stage. Thank you so much, Martin, for your beautiful words about your experience in Teach for America and in general, and for the very long introduction. I'm not sure where you found that bio, but, um, and thank you, all of you, for coming out at this kind of volatile time in our country's history. Um, I just think whatever your political party or perspective. This campaign and election season has, I assume, made clear just the magnitude of the challenges ahead of us, um, you know, with just huge economic turbulence, which has already left so many folks so disenfranchised and which promises to just continue. Um, and at the same time, I think what we've seen in our country and is really just indicative of global trends around increasing levels of kind of nationalism and isolationism and prejudice and such, um, which I guess all of that together has 
led me personally, I'll just say, to think all the more about just how urgently we need to think about, I'm sure many things, I mean, it's such a complex set of issues, but I just, I don't see the path out without putting a lot of new energy and new focus around education and not even education as, as we know it. Um, I think we need to come together in our communities and as a global community as well and really consider how we're going to ensure that the kids in our classrooms today are in fact you know, growing as the leaders necessary to, to actually be able to navigate a turbulent economy and solve the global challenges facing us with the compassion and tolerance and empathy that will be required. Um, so that is all very much on my mind and I'll kind of return to some of that um, later on in, in my talk. But all to say, I, I just personally feel incredibly lucky to have found my way to this arena you know, I guess now 28 years ago, really. Um, and to to actually have started in it early enough to actually have a chance to, alongside many others, make a, a real difference in, in moving the needle on on all of this. So, um, so yeah, uh, I'll share a bit about about this journey and, and how I got into it and, um, you know, kind of where it's where it's led us and and what we're trying to do now and and then i'll step back given the kind of social entrepreneurship theme of the night and i guess of the week um and and just share some of the lessons i've learned along the the journey of of social entrepreneurship so this is the thesis um a few things led me to this idea when i was a senior in college I, you know, in 1988 and 89, um, we were part of what was called the me generation. And that all our generation wanted to do was go out and make a lot of money and, and work on Wall Street. And I was convinced that this was just not true. Um, everyone I knew was searching for a way to make a real difference in the world. And we just weren't finding it. You know, the recruiters who were at the time banging down our doors as, as liberal arts majors were all investment banks and management consulting firms asking us to commit just two years to work in their firms. And I had become really focused. I was a public policy major and, and just as a concerned college student had become really focused on the inequities in our country, the fact that this place that aspires very admirably to be a place of equal opportunity simply isn't one. And um, I'd started focusing on this question of, I mean, I don't think we called it this at the time, but educational inequity, the fact that educational outcomes were so different depending on um, kind of the circumstances of your birth, your economic background, your racial background. And one day, all of this just came together in my head in an idea, you know, why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit two years to teach in our country's lowest income communities as we were being commit, you know, recruited to commit just two years to, to work on Wall Street. And I became very obsessed with this idea um, and have become a, you know, been obsessed ever since, uh, really because I thought it would play itself out on two different levels, that on the one hand, we'd be channeling all this energy and talent into classrooms, and that would make a real difference in the lives of kids and in communities. Um, but at the same time, I also thought there'd be this other power to it, like how powerful would it be to take all these, you know, well-educated future leaders and have their first two years out of college be working with kids in low-income communities instead of working in banks on Wall Street. I was just convinced that this was going to change everything in our country. It changed the priorities of a generation. It changed the consciousness of the country and that we'd start making different decisions as a result. So that was the idea. And it was, it was clearly just one of these ideas whose time had come. Um, I can't tell you how true that is. It, it's this thing where I would tell people this idea and they would say, doesn't that already exist? I was sure it did. I spent half the time of my thesis research trying to figure out who had actually started it or was about to start it. It was just one of those things. And um, I was also blessed with 
you know, the advantage of naivete and inexperience. I really did not know why this did not make sense. And so I just went for it. I wrote to these executives who were all quoted in a Fortune magazine article at the time saying that they wanted to improve education and got a seed grant, et cetera, et cetera. All to say, one year after I graduated from college, I was looking out on an auditorium full of the first 500 people who had signed up to teach in six communities. Um, so that was the beginning. Uh, over the last now 27 or so years, um, Teach for America has brought 50,000 folks into this work in, in 53 communities. Um, they've really stayed in the work. And so, you know, 8,000 of them are teaching in the midst of their two years. Um, of the other 42,000, um, 86% of them are doing mission-related work. About two-thirds of the whole are working in education. Um, some of them are teaching, they're running schools, they're in a you know, district-level administration, they're working in state departments, they're in NGOs supporting the change. Um, others, about 20%, are in other sectors, um, but they're doing things in policy or law or medicine or uh, any number of other things uh, to address this kind of very systemic issue. About 10 years ago, I started meeting people all over the world. I wasn't thinking about anything global. I had my head down. I was focused on you know, this massive issue in our own country. Um, but I met within one year 13 people from 13 different countries, from India to Lebanon to Chile to China to the next place, who were all determined. I mean, one thing or another had led them to think, I've got to do this in, in our countries. And they were looking for help, and um, so that's what ultimately led, about a year after that, nine years ago now, to the launch of Teach for All, which, as you heard, is a network of independent, locally-led organizations in all, all these different countries. And what brings all those organizations together is a shared kind of purpose, a purpose around developing collective leadership, as we think about it to ensure all kids fulfill their potential. Um, we are all brought together in this belief that what holds whole segments of kids back in every, really virtually every country in the world is a very complex set of challenges. It relates to challenges that they're facing before they even show up at school, whether it be the challenges of poverty or discrimination of one sort or another. Um, and they show up at schools if we're lucky. Many kids still don't show up at schools, but when they do, um, those schools were just not set up to meet their extra needs. And so everyone stuck in that system is sort of set up for a really challenging time. And then there's a whole set of mindsets and policies and practices that kind of fuel this whole thing. And we just believe that the only path to solving a problem that complex is to address it in its full complexity. We don't believe we can solve this through teachers alone. I mean, her heroic teachers can do a lot, and we need as many heroic teachers as possible, but it's not the ultimate answer. We need to change schools and school systems. We need to you know, address the challenges that kids face outside of schools that make the work of schools so challenging. We need to take on the underlying mindsets. There's just a lot. And so the question that keeps us all across the world up at night is, who's going to do all this in a world where our most educated, most capable folks, I mean, there's a feeding frenzy for those people's energy because every sector knows people are everything and leadership is everything. And so very few of our world's most prepared and capable folks end up channeling their energy into this arena of making a difference for the most marginalized kids. Um, and, and that's what we're all working to address. I'm every day grateful for the incredible people around the world who are making this happen in their countries because what I've seen over the last 10 years is just how much faster we can move when we're learning from each other across borders. It turns out that the problems we're addressing, the roots of them are eerily similar and the silver lining in that is that the solutions are shareable. And so we're realizing the power of developing 
deeply rooted local leaders all around the world who are actually informed by understanding what's possible and what's working in, in other contexts around the world. I wanted to share just a couple of examples of how this work of ours is playing out in communities. This is a picture of the city of Pune in India. Um, it was one of the first two cities where Teach for India started working about seven years ago now. It's a city of about three million people, a couple or three hours outside of Mumbai. Um, and about 20% of the kids don't complete primary school. 80% of them will not make it through secondary school. Um, it's hardly, I mean, there are many places in India where the outcomes are far worse, but it's a place where not only is, is that not setting kids up for success, but the outcomes are, have actually been historically getting worse over, over time. Um, so Teach for India has placed about four or 500 teachers in, in this city. Um, and I went and visited about a year ago and was just uh, really inspired to see what already the alumni of Teach for India were doing, working alongside many others. One of them had actually started a coalition of business leaders and leaders in uh, the, the government to, actually, to develop a plan to improve the education system. Um, three of them had started different teacher development initiatives. One was retraining government teachers. She felt that it was just so unfair that as a Teach for India a core member and, and teacher, she was given so much training and support, and yet the government teachers in her same school hadn't had a, someone visit and give feedback for 20 years, 25 years in some cases. She just got a contract to retrain 1,800 teachers this year in the city of Pune from the school system. Another has started an incredibly scalable model of recruiting the fresh education degree grads from the Pune universities who come out not knowing what a lesson plan is and retraining them, giving them the same coaching and support and um, stipend and such that the Teach for India folks get. Another had developed an online teacher development uh, program that all the other teacher development organizations are using. Still another group of Teach for India alums have started a plan to start 25 new secondary schools in the next five years. They've started the first four of them um, and they did that because the English medium system stops in the seventh standard or the seventh grade, so there's no path for those kids to get to university, and they want to fully solve that problem in the next five years. This is seven years in. The oldest of those people are five years out of their teaching um, fellowship, and I just think about where will we be in Pune five years from now? Um, as those folks gain more experience as others join them. Um, here in the US, we're able to see what's happening in communities not just seven years in or eight years in, but in fact, in some cases, 25 or 26 years in. Um, and I'll just share one example of, of our nation's capital. Um, when we started placing teachers there in 1991, um, and actually even up until about 15 years ago, it was the lowest performing of all the urban districts in our country. The kids, by the time they were in fourth grade, the kids were already two years behind the kids in Harlem. 4% um, of the kids in DC would go to college um, and, get, and get through college. Um, no one had any hope. You know, 15 years ago, I remember working alongside Teach for America's local executive director at the time, trying to raise money for our, our work. We wanted to grow our core in DC. And we met civic leaders who are still in DC who actually remember these conversations and you know, remember them clearly. Uh, folks were like, we're done. We've actually tried everything. These were good people. They had tried a lot to try to change things in the school system and they were just like, nothing, nothing's working. Um, there was really no hope that things could change. This system is now the fastest improving urban system in the history of the country. Um, in the last four years, this whole system has moved up about a year in performance levels, meaning if you met the average fourth grader uh, four years ago and the average fourth grader now, they're a year, they're performing at a, a year's higher level now. That's really significant progress across the whole system. 
The enrollment rate has gone up for the first time in years in the last, you know, four or five years. It's gone up 11 percentage points. The graduation rate has gone up 11 percentage points in the last five years or so. Um, there are whole schools, probably 40, 50 whole schools in D.C. that are putting about half of their kids on a trajectory to graduate from college, up from four or five percent based on, you know, the demographic in, in D.C. So this system has, I mean, we're seeing in real outcomes for kids, it's nowhere near where it needs to be, but it is on the right trajectory. A lot of things happen to create that, a lot of things, reform-minded mayors, the civic leaders who saw the light and decided to be part of the change, veteran teachers who were there and are still there, who were there before we appeared on the scene. It's also really true that if you took the Teach for America people out of D.C., it's really hard to imagine where all the energy and leadership that's driven the change would, would have come from. The last two schools chancellors who led and presided over the change were Teach for America alums. About three quarters of the senior team of the district, 25 percent of the school principals are Teach for America alums, 900 teachers in the system, the state commissioner for the last six teachers of the year, um, the leaders of many of the NGOs supporting the change. Um, so that's a little bit about when we say collective leadership to ensure all kids fulfill their potential, that's really what we're working to do all over the world is develop locally rooted leadership um, that will actually over time change things for kids. Um, what we have seen and, and learned has given us a lot of optimism about, about what we can do through this. And um, I spent the last year um, in a process working with these 40 partners around the world to try to develop a vision of where we're going to be 25 years ago. And we've come together around this vision of you know, having whole communities in every part of the world that are actually showing us what's possible, that are showing us that all kids can have the education, the support, the opportunity um, to grow as leaders who will shape a better future for themselves and all of us, and to ensure that those communities that are showing us what's possible are inspiring and informing a worldwide movement to do this everywhere. To get to that vision um, is going to take a lot. It's going to take us keeping our foot on the pedal in, you know, steadily bringing in and developing more and more and stronger and stronger leaders who during two year commitments to teach and every year beyond that are working at every level of school systems and outside of school systems as well, alongside many others to affect the changes we need to see. Um, it's going to take to the previous set of comments really reimagining education. We need to see a full and qualitative shift in the kind of education that our teachers and alumni and others in our communities are actually providing our kids. It's not enough to work towards a narrow set of academic outcomes. We need to figure out how to build in our kids the competencies, the awareness, the kind of values, the agency necessary to really lead change in their own lives and in our broader society. It's going to take building a level of interconnectivity across the world so that these very locally rooted leaders will actually understand more and more and more about what's possible through learning from each other. Um, and, and it'll probably take a lot more than that. Um, so just stepping back for a moment and as i said i'm i'm so excited that i got started in this early enough to actually have a chance to work alongside many others to um you know to to have a shot at reaching a vision like this um for just lessons from the social entrepreneurship journey and the first of them really kind of builds from that last point which is I, again, I'm so glad I started early. And, and the reason is that, you know, it, it is possible to solve these very complex problems, but it is, it is in fact very complex and it takes a lot of time. And I'm just so happy to have the, a shot at, um, at actually moving the needle in a big way in my lifetime. Um, I don't know if you all 
saw this commencement speech that Bill Gates gave at Harvard several years ago now, um, where he said he was really unhappy with Harvard. And he was saying that because he, he felt that he wasn't exposed to the big social challenges. And he was saying, I mean, who knows what he would have really done, but he was saying he just really regrets not focusing his energy on the biggest issues in the world earlier, because what he's realized is they're actually solvable, but it does take time. They're super complex. So that's one thing, you know, biggest lesson, start early and start early as well, because your inexperience is actually one of your biggest assets. Once you learn the way the world works, you start accepting things as they are and thinking it's normal. And honestly, we need a lot. And there's a reason that young people, you look at history, a lot of innovation, a lot of the most important movements in the world have been led by young people. We need folks' energy before you understand what's not possible. Um, we need the crazy questions. And so that's, that's, that's thought one. Um, thought two is to get into the arena, um, you know, meaning, you know, really become immersed in in communities um, and in sort of the problem and the solution that you uh, care most about. Don't start a social enterprise just to start a social enterprise. You know, go at working to solve a problem. And if it takes starting a social enterprise, then then do it. Um, I actually think this is one of the reasons and I, I really can't claim to have I don't I kind of fell, as you heard, into the idea of of Teach for America initially. And I don't think I could have understood why exactly it would be powerful. But um, what we've seen over time is that teaching is it is a transformational experience for anyone who does it teaching in the highest need communities in our country, the relationships, as you heard from Martine, you know, the relationships you build fuel a lifetime of commitment. You gain a level of understanding and grounding in the complexity of the problem, the complexity of the solutions that ultimately make you a very different leader. Um, and so that's my second thought is just whatever issue it is that you care most about, get on the ground and start working at it um, before figuring out exactly what the big idea is that you're, you're gonna pursue. Um, thirdly, embrace the long game. Um, you know, we live in an era of quick fixes. We can change the way the world communicates overnight, et cetera. Um, but the issues that we're addressing in the social change arena, it just takes time to make a sustainable and, and meaningful difference. Um, I was in Chicago yesterday and um, it was just really, it was an interesting reflective opportunity because we spent a decade, the first decade of Teach for America trying to get into Chicago. You know, we wanted to place teachers in Chicago and, um, you know, we, we had a lot of trouble getting into the city. They started Teach for Chicago instead, et cetera. And about 10 years in, um, one of the superintendents there invited us into the city. So we started placing teachers there, but the first five years, so we started in about 2000, were the most intense five years of a new startup site ever in our history. Um, and we thought regularly, maybe we just need to leave Chicago. This just isn't maybe the place for us. So now we've been there for, I guess, 15 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you follow the news about Chicago, but if you do, you probably, most people don't think much good is happening in Chicago. Um, there is huge political strife. There's a new superintendent every year. There's a union leader who's one of the most um, kind of vitriolic in, in the country. If you read the headlines, you'd think nothing was happening. Um, but someone showed me this data yesterday, which showed that next to Washington, D.C., Chicago in the last decade has made more progress on this national assessment of educational progress than any other urban system. Their kids have moved forward actually quite significantly. Um, 
The graduation rate has increased 16 percentage points in the last six years uh, from high school, and the college graduation rate of the Chicago public school kids, it's hard to move those rates, right? You've got to get your kids through high school, and then you've got to get, it's based on ninth graders, right? The percentage of ninth graders who end up getting through high school and getting into and through college, that rate has doubled in Chicago in the last 10 years, 9% to 18%. By point of reference, in Boston, it's 7%. 7% of kids in one of the most educated cities in this country graduate from, from college. Um, so, you know, there are many things, again, in Chicago that have contributed to the progress that, that we have seen, but alongside many others, the Teach for America people are making a huge difference. They're running 100 of the schools. Um, 1,500 of them are still teaching. They're running most of the NGOs outside the system that are supporting the change. It's really hard to imagine how we would have seen the progress we've seen if it weren't for those folks. So all to say, perseverance, playing the long game. I'm glad we stuck with it. I'm glad we didn't leave Chicago because they do think it's made a huge difference. So I always say to folks, like, there are a lot of things that are not my greatest strength, but I can do a couple things, which is persevere and embrace the learning journey, you know, learn, reflect, evolve. We can really all do that. Um, so that's, that's the third thing I'd say. And last thing is just um, to be locally rooted and globally informed. Um, I just see more and more how crucial that is. I, knowing the ins and outs of what has happened in DC over the last 10 years, um, you know, if you really get into it, you realize a huge part of that story is the degree to which um, the folks ultimately in D.C. embraced working in deep partnership with folks in the communities, with kids, with parents and, and families. Without being locally rooted, there is no path to progress. If you spend time with the alumni of Teach for India in Pune and say, where did all this come from? Where's all the entrepreneurship coming from? They'd say, you know what? We saw all these folks around the world doing this stuff. We just brought it back and adapted it to India. You talk to the you know, leading thinkers in Finland, in Shanghai, the leading systems in the world, right? Do you know what they say is the number one reason their school systems are the best in the world? Both, I heard these two people speak separately, they both said the same thing. Number one, we embraced an open door policy. We sent our educators out to understand what the rest of the world was doing. Um, so I'll just close out um, and really look forward if we have time for questions and answers to have a real discussion. But with the a last thought, um, which is that, and I just think it's particularly relevant at such an end really like what our example I think shows and what so many others have seen through their own efforts in different arenas. You know, you listen to Muhammad Yunus and his big thing is what I learned, the Nobel Prize winner who, um, you know, spent three decades or so working on microfinance is we can solve poverty. I just met this incredible woman who is sort of single-handedly seemingly taking on the water shortage issue. And you know, meeting with her is like, this is so overwhelming. Like, how are you? And she's like, no, but it's solvable. Like you get into this stuff and you realize these challenges are solvable. The only question is whether enough of our most capable, driven, committed, brilliant folks will channel their energy against them. And, you know, I look at what, you know, I just saw this, this, data and it really confirmed a lot that we've sensed is happening out there on college campuses. But if you look at just the data from the top 15 campuses, which is all I have access to around this, this statistic, but four years ago, 20% of the kids at those campuses channeled their energy into the social sector. 13% did last year. That's huge. That is a huge difference. So when I went to Chicago, actually, this guy was showing me this data, and there was another slide which showed if we keep our foot on the pedal in Chicago, by 10 years from now, the percentage of kids in CPS, Chicago Public Schools, low-income kids of color who will be graduating from college will beat the national average. 
The question is, are we going to be able to keep our foot on the pedal? Honestly, if we can't figure out how to channel still more, like the most entrepreneurial, energized and deeply committed folks and a very diverse group of them into this arena going forward, it's not going to happen. Like your choices matter so much. And we need to not only keep our foot on the pedal, but accelerate in a big way because we need to not only work towards equity, but really as we, as I said before, like change the nature of the kind of education we're providing. So huge challenges ahead. I'm placing my bets in the folks on today's college campuses and just praying that folks decide to make it happen. So thank you all. Thank you.